coming up on the SPNN Forum, I'm speaking with St. Paul's new mayor, Melvin Carter. That's coming up on the SPNN Forum. Welcome to the SPNN Forum, Mayor Carter. I'm so happy you could join us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Great. You know, when I do these interviews, I love to start by just doing a little bit of your origins. And mm -hmm. you have quite a story about you. You've, you've been, your family's been here for a long time. And I just wondered what you could tell us just briefly about where you came from. <laughs> where I came from, briefly, yeah, huh? Yeah, briefly. Uh, our family's been here four generations. I'm raising the fifth here right now, uh, excited for our family's history here. Uh, which has not all been joyful, honestly, as we've shared, you know, from moving here from, you know, the deep south uh, to find opportunity to, you know, being uprooted from our old Rondo community uh, to just growing up uh, in St. Paul in our rec centers and libraries and schools. Uh, I found this to be an incredibly supportive and nurturing community, also a space where we continue to have deep disparities. Uh, and so, you know, I'm excited to just be, continue to be a part of this community that's raised me in so many ways. Excited to raise my children in the same rec centers and libraries and schools that I grew up in. Uh, and excited to just work with people all over this city to write the next chapter. And how many children do you have in your family? We have five children. We have a blended family and our children are 10, 10, 12, 23, and 25. Fantastic. And are they all living in the city? No, the okay. oldest two are uh, are out of the city, one in L.A. and one in Mankato. So they, right. they, they, they come around every now and That's then, nice. and we love it when they do. Well, another quick question I have, because I have um, a little bit of history with your grandfather, because mm -hmm. I know he played instruments, and I know you've been a musician, but I wondered about your uh, sort of creative life, your experience as a, as a creative. Mm. Uh, I grew up very much within the kind of arts community in St. Paul. Uh, my mother actually founded a nonprofit arts organization right here in our city. Uh, and I grew up uh, taking music lessons at Walker West Music Academy and actually even in Reverend Walker's living room before Walker West right? Music Academy was really a thing. Uh, doing storytelling and African drumming and dance from the African in the West African tradition, uh, doing the occasional play uh, at Stepping Stone Theater, and even watching my mother, you know, perform in you know shows in, in Penumbra and other theaters as well around here. Uh, so I very much grew up within the uh, artistic community right here in St. Paul, and find that to be one of the most uh, incredible parts about our community here. Yes, yeah, it's Gran pretty pretty rich. Grandpa yeah. was a uh, jazz trumpet player. Trumpet player. Yes, mm -hmm. and grew, and was kind of a, a staple uh, in a pillar in the jazz scene uh, in Minnesota for a really long time. Played with Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie and Sarah Vaughn and some of those kind of incredible names. Uh, not to mention all the kind of greats that have come. Uh, out of Minnesota, so uh, I tinker at the piano uh, here and there, uh, and uh, but you know in our in our family it's hard to consider yourself a musician uh, when Grandpa played with Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a little intimidating. <laughs> right, <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> well, it, but it's still it's still part of your life. A yeah, very much so. Absolutely. Very much so. Mike, he 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 uh, passed me a piano, and I play that piano uh, every day, and it makes me feel like I'm kind of hanging out with him. That's fabulous. Well, you also know how to do a dance move, and it, I, I, a lot of people have talked about you and your fraternity brothers yes. and the dance at the your inaugural ball. Yes. Uh, so, did you spend your whole life dancing too, or was that just a? Like I suppose a so. You know what? I have a rule that I tell my kids: uh, when the music is great, you, you have to dance. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a good way to live. And, you know, those, those are some guys who uh, I love dearly, who, you know, we've been close to each other for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, and that's how we end a celebration. And so, you know, we've done, you know, had parties on co in college and people get married and all kinds of different celebrations like that. I think they were as surprised as anybody <laughs> that uh, we did it at an inaugural ball. It was but it was cool. a lot of fun. Well, I, one of the things I'm real excited about when I hear you talk about what you see for St. Paul mm -hmm. and for the city, um, I'm very interested that you seem to lead with a notion of vision. Mm. Like you, uh, the article I just read that was in the Star Tribune, I think talked mm. about you and your running, that you, when you run, you kind of see the end of the race, you yeah. picture something at the end. Yeah. And I also recently heard you talk about uh, how you think about the, the children of St. Paul 
and sort of the pull that you imagine them pulling us into becoming a yeah. global city. Could yeah. you talk a little bit about where did you get that idea of vision, yeah. how it informs you, uh, and how it's affecting your leadership? You know, you're right. Uh, track and field was an important part of my life for the whole first half. I w went to college on an athletic scholarship and uh, lo fell in love with the sport. Uh, between my parents, who are big advocates of visioning, uh, and my coaches at that time, I, I had a coach who would always tell me about the importance of visioning. He'd require us to watch videos of the Olympics and videos of the World Championships because uh, he felt like there's just nothing more powerful than the human mind uh, and its ability to see something and create it. And so as we think about our vision for the community, uh, and, and the first thing I'll say is I think uh, much more important than you know what any one person, including the mayor's vision for a community is, is what's our operational vision for our community that, that, that we live in and we live toward every day. And so I believe that St. Paul has uh, every ingredient uh, to be the type of community we want to be in 40 years and that requires us to be able to see beyond today and even tomorrow to think about you know in the next generation uh, what are the what are going to be the common points of the cities and the communities that thrive uh, I believe it's going to be places where we can have great schools that we can send our, our children to, that we can enjoy uh, nature and our natural environment, our river and our lakes, uh, that we can raise our children around people who are from different places and speak different languages. Uh, we have all of those things. We have work to do on being a type of place where people can live without owning a car, but we're making progress where that's concerned as well. So we have, across our community in many ways, uh, one of the things I've heard loud and clear is that people in every neighborhood uh, have bigger, bolder visions for their children, for their businesses, for their households uh, than sometimes they feel like City Hall meets them with. Uh, and so our goal is to activate their vision uh, and meet them from City Hall in pursuing that big vision for the city. That's exciting. Well, I, I'm. I was particularly struck, I, I was able to attend two parts of the Reconnecting Rondo mm. event, and we'll maybe touch on that a little bit mm -hmm. later, but that uh, was a very inspiring day, and I got to hear you speak at the very beginning, and one of the things I loved that you said when you talked about um, us as a global city mm -hmm. and talked about not so much, you, you mentioned the gap, mm -hmm. but you also set a vision, and I wondered if you'd restate that. Well, that's I one of the of things that we've heard from people, all, mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I've learned from just visiting with people all over this city, uh, is that in many ways the things that we look at as our biggest challenges uh, really represent our biggest opportunities as a community. That starts with our river where you know we're a city in the first place because we've got more linear frontage of river than any other city you know on the mississippi river uh, wow. and and too often what we do is we build a bridge to get over the right. river as opposed to celebrating the river turning our city to face the river and identifying more and more ways for people to interact with the river it's an engine for us it's a social and economic engine for us and when we treat it like a problem we're selling ourselves short the same is true of our diversity. When we just talk about closing the gaps, uh, I was in a meeting and somebody said, we want a city where everybody can succeed despite our racial and cultural and ling language differences. Uh, and I said, that's wrong. We're, 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 we can build a city where everybody can succeed because of our racial and cultural and economic, a, a, ethnic differences. And so when we just talk about uh, closing gaps, we're missing an opportunity to talk about opening the doors of the global economy that should exist in a city as diverse as St. Paul. When we just talk about teaching uh, children who speak a, diff a language other than English at home, when we just talk about teaching them English as a second language, we're missing the opportunity in that every business in the world right now is looking for a multilingual workforce, a multilingual community to tap into. Those are our competitive advantages as a city. We can't play them like liabilities. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear you express it that way, and I think it's extremely motivating to us to, when we hear that. And I, I see your role. Uh, my, my vision of you is that you are setting a beacon for us, but I really hear you also making it very clear that what you really want to do is activate uh, the community. You want to, you're a good listener, and you're responding. And I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about what are the key things you want to activate um, the community around. What do you want to activate the residents toward? You know, I shared, uh, I appreciate the question. I, I've, I've shared, you know, that our family's one of those Rondo families that lost everything when I-94 came in and uprooted our uh, historic African-American neighborhood. 
Uh, we've got a lot of stories like that. Uh, and when we talk about building a city in St. Paul that works for all of us, it's a tacit acknowledgement that sometimes our city doesn't work as well in some neighborhoods and in some communities as it does in others. Uh, I believe, and one thing that I've learned really well is that when you have exclusive processes, that's what creates disparities. That's how we create disparities. When we make policy and resource decisions uh, without certain folks, without certain neighborhoods, without certain communities at the table, over and over and over again, over a decade or over a generation, uh, then we shouldn't be surprised when we have disparities because by definition, that's how we create them. And so our goal is to be the exact opposite of that. We have to engage people in our community if we want a city government that really reflects our entire community. And so we've started with our community-based hiring process through which we asked over 100 uh, residents and community members to come together and help us read through resumes, to help us interview and vet candidates. Uh, and that resulted in an incredibly, in an incredibly diverse and incredibly talented uh, administration that really does reflect the diversity of our city. Uh, we've asked, we've uh, revised our city's use of force policy uh, after two months of engagement, public engagement, about what it should be. Um, my hat goes off to our police chief. I can't find any example of any police department anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world uh, who've engaged community in a deep uh, and honest conversation about what a use of force policy should look like. Uh, and now we're moving forward to the state of, state of our city summit, which I hope we get a chance to chat about, yeah. uh, which does the same. It invites people to come in and say, we're gonna be a part of this city together. We have a bigger vision uh, than any one person and than any mayor uh, or even my incredible team alone can implement for our city. So we need the help. We need people plugged in to help build the vision, to help make it a reality in our city. Uh, and in order to ask people to come help do the work, we have to give people an opportunity to help uh, build the vision together first. Well, why don't we go ahead and talk about that uh, summit? Yes. We'll touch on it a couple of times probably yes. because it's coming right up and that was one of the reasons we wanted to get together mm -hmm. now. So you're over about 100 days in something like close, that yes. close okay and so did you time the uh the gathering and this opportunity to reflect that that not necessarily that? intentionally it worked mm -hmm. out that way okay. uh, and we know folks will want to have a conversation around the 100 day mark uh, but our goal as always has been to just engage people in that two-way conversation so whereas a state of the city has traditionally been uh, sort of a one-way conversation where the mayor just gives a speech and says here's what i think uh, about where we are and what where we should go next for the city, uh, we're, we've changed that to a state of our city to first say this, re this city really belongs to all of us, not just the mayor, to be able to lead that conversation. So our goal is for one, uh, me to share with folks, this is where I see we are right now and where I'd like to see us go next. For two, people to get a chance to engage uh, with each other. Uh, who've heard and listened to that uh, message to be able to learn from each other about it to say how does that impact you what do you think about it so that we can all build context together uh, and to three for people to be able to have an opportunity to talk back to our city leaders uh, to their city council members and say he here, here's what i support or here's what i need more information on or how come nobody's talking about this issue uh, we want this to be an ongoing two-way conversation uh, every step along the way and that's why that summit's so important to us so if you're just joining us, I'm speaking with Mayor Melvin Carter, the new mayor of St. Paul. And so the uh, summit, or the yes. gathering, is going to be on Saturday morning. Yes, uh, it's Saturday. April, 14, April 14th. Yes. Okay. At Johnson Senior High School from 9 to noon. So when Doors people, open at 8.30. <laughs> doors open at 8.30. We're going to put that information up. It will be a link to the... Uh, people can register yes. for that. Uh, if they don't register in advance, how does does that affect anything? Um, we want folks to register in advance so that we just know how many people to plan for, mm -hmm. but we really want people to come. Uh, so don't let that be so a barrier. Our hope is that nothing please is a barrier. Please register and That's right. please come. That's right. And so that'll be a great opportunity. They'll get those three parts. They get to meet people. They'll get to talk with each yes. other, and they're going to give you a little That's exactly sense of right. how they feel, but they, they'll hear from you. That's exactly right. That sounds like a great day, and I will be there. Thank um, you. But let's, um, I wanted to talk about these uh, the, these pillars. You've, you've talked about... Uh, some key areas you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. the police safety mm -hmm. as one of those uh, you want to I'd like to talk about economic justice and I'd like to talk not only about the $15 an hour wage but I wanted to talk about the difference between talking about jobs and wealth creation yes so and I think that's a really really interesting turn 
uh, you're not the only one talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, others are, but I think to bring it right into the sense of how do we as residents of a city contribute to not simply thinking about jobs, but to think about wealth. Right. How do you see that? Well, one, I'm really glad not to be the only one talking about that because that's such a critical conversation for us. So our, 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 our view is we have to shift our perspective on a lot of things. So where economic development is concerned, for example, We've thought about our role in economic development for a long time as, you know, finding some business somewhere else to move into St. Paul yeah. and that that's success. Right now, we have, for every 10 job openings in the Twin Cities metro area, we have eight job seekers. And so what that tells me is that really upstream from, like, even job creation, which is what we always talk about, upstream from finding a business to move them to St. Paul, uh, upstream of all of that, we have to figure out what are all the barriers that are preventing people from participating in the workforce, from participating uh, in our local economy, from opening a business or buying a home, and how do we identify and remove those barriers? That's where a lot of our pillars really come from because too often those barriers uh, might be education. People need the opportunity to gain training or get a credential in something. Uh, it might be looking for childcare for their, for their children so they can go to work. Uh, it might be looking for transportation. You know, we have places on the east side and the west side where it takes five minutes to get downtown in a car, but 30, maybe 40 minutes to get there by bus. That's a barrier right there. Uh, and it may be our, our, our criminal justice system because you know, one in five, say, one in five Minnesotans right now have have something that can come up on a criminal background check. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we uh, are a place where people who re-enter our community from uh, incarceration can find a safe, nurturing, and welcoming environment. We want to eliminate every barrier that exists to individuals uh, participating in our local economy. And when we do that, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're opening the doors for our entire local economy to thrive and succeed. So income is one part of it, but you really touched on uh, having the tools to turn income into wealth. And so that is one of the things that excites me because as we raise the minimum wage, and I do plan on raising the minimum wage here in St. Paul to $15 an hour, I want to be the mayor that signs that into law before the end of this year, and I'm excited about that work. And along with that, we have to ensure that our families uh, can access uh, you know, financial institutions and financial products uh, that aren't predatory upon them, that aren't charging them 300% interest. Uh, so introducing families to responsible financial institutions uh, is something that's important to me, helping families understand credit, uh, understand saving, and be able to kind of not just have um, have, have additional income, but be able to get out of some of the cycles of poverty that cause low-income families to spend up to 10% of their income on financial products alone, that'd yeah. be difficult for anybody to get Absolutely. out of that revolving door. That'd be crazy mm -hmm. uh, because of the percentage they're going to have to spend on housing, That's which right. is another one of our challenges. That's right. But I, I want to dive a little bit further into this. I'm, I'm interested, I know you were over at Sunrise Banks mm -hmm. recently. I know um, uh, the, this question of financial products. I'm thinking about financial literacy too. Yes. And I know that you have this goal too of starting a savings account for, yes. for children for them to go to college or get a, beyond high mm -hmm. school. Um, do you see that as, as, a, as a key to wealth creation? Absolutely, I see that as a key to wealth creation. Our college savings accounts uh, initiative is probably the one thing we're working on that I'm most excited about. Uh, the reason is this. When we were building the St. Paul Promise neighborhood some 10 years ago, one of my mentors would constantly say to me, stop helping kids beat the odds and start changing the odds. That was the spirit behind the St. Paul Promise neighborhood. So when we think about changing the odds, that's where our college savings account proposal comes in. You know, one of the great things about you know, social media is people get the chance to be very generous with their opinions. Uh, and <laughs> That's a really positive spin. I try to be positive and optimistic <laughs> about everything where I can. One of the things that we've been hearing ever since I, I proposed that in my inaugural address is $50 isn't enough. $50 won't pay for college. And of course it won't. Uh, but research shows that young people from low-income families uh, who have a little bit put away for college, like $50, $125, Young students from low-income families uh, who have less than $500 in a college savings account are three times more likely to go to college, and when they do, four times more likely to graduate. That says it's really not about the amount of money, it's about the power of the investment that we make when we tell our children that we believe in you enough to invest in your future. 
And so we're committed to that. It's an educational initiative, but it's also a two generation initiative that says, we're gonna work to connect families to resources. And as we uh, show families how to save for college, uh, a family that can save for college can save for retirement. They can save to buy a home or, or, or buy a car or for a vacation or whatever the rest of those family needs are. Uh, as we, uh, you know, deposit those funds in our local banks or our local kind of credit unions, we're connecting families to responsible financial institutions that aren't charging them 200 and 300 percent interest uh, to get access to credit. Uh, and so I absolutely see that as a financial literacy, as a hands-on uh, financial literacy uh, initiative that's going to help us uh, both kind of secure the 40-year generational future for our city while helping stabilize families right now. I, I think that's the research is fascinating and that'll be a really mm -hmm. nice tool to keep helping people understand that that it's not so much about how much is that dollar but what is that pull it's that's really right. kind of back to vision if that savings account is there and I would simply add you mentioned two generation I think it's at least a three generation yeah. initiative because our, our daughter probably, we would have had much more debt if it hadn't been for That's right. grandparents who That's had right. helped us, uh, her grandparents That's who right. had helped us with those investments. So it's not just That's about right. the family, the, the parents saving, it's not just about, That's uh, right. you know, it takes, it really does take a whole village to make those things work. So um, how are, I, I wanted to ask about two little things. Um, what's been like a really hard moment that you didn't expect? A hard moment. I'll tell you what, one of the biggest surprises in it has, has been the amount of variables and thoughtfulness that go into snow. <laughs> we've had, uh, as it snows upon, as us, it today. Snows upon us today, mm -hmm. we've actually had, and this is part of climate change, you know, our, our extreme climate events, our extreme weather events, you know, we've had more snow emergencies in the first three months of 2018 than we have in the last two years combined. <laughs> I had no idea. And that's creating some challenges for us. And, and that affects your budget. And, and that very much affects our budget. Um, and it of course affects just quality of life in our city because we have to be able uh, to get around our city, our, our, our streets and the way we get through, uh, you know, having our streets clear and passable, having our potholes filled and kind of having our, keeping our streets ready to go uh, is critical to people get, being able to get to work, to being able to get to school. So all of the, these ambitions that we're talking about uh, as a, it's critical for an ambulance to be able to get to our mm -hmm. homes uh, in, an, in the case of an emergency. Uh, and one of the things I think that's been an amazing surprise to me is the extent to which uh, no two snowstorms are alike, uh, is the extent to which you know we've got an incredible public work staff, uh, an incredible set of drivers. I've gone out and met with them uh, at night on occasion as they were kind of getting ready to go out on the plows. Uh, I went out on my first kind of snow emergency. I went out to introduce myself to the drivers, and they all stopped to say, "Hey, we're you know congratulations, it's good." And I was going, "No, no, no, keep <laughs> keep working, <laughs> keep going, go right? plow the snow." <laughs> Uh, but we've got a great group of folks, and I've learned a great deal about snow. You know that you know it, when I was a kid, it either snowed or it didn't snow. You know now we're we're, we're tracking questions like is it going to be a, a wet snow, which is heavier, or a, kind of a drier snow, which is a little bit lighter? Is it going to snow twice in a row, which we had happen, which was very rare in terms of two kind of snow emergencies right in a row? Uh, is it going to snow and then warm up or is it going to snow and then cool down? Uh, and all of those variables impact how we attack a snowstorm. Uh, and so that's been an uh, incredible learning experience for me that, you know, uh, has, has uh, created at least one publicly challenging moment for us on the first one as we had, you know, children, you know, stuck yeah. on school buses uh, working to get home, you know, as our, our bus drivers, our teachers, our EAs, our principals, uh, our, you know, s school district kind of central office all the way up to our superintendent uh, all work together to take care of kids and get them home. That was probably one of our most challenging moments uh, so far in the last three months. But I'd say it was also one of the most beautiful moments for our city as we saw people just people just jump in. Pull in together. That's right. Well, I want to talk to you with just a little time we have left. Um, you, you know, when you think about, uh, and I'd love to know if there's another highlight. If there's that was a little bit of a of a low light, and maybe I want you to kind of turn it toward in the direction of, once you do that summit, what would you like to see in the next six months, mm -hmm. in the next nine months, in the next, you know, I'd like to sit down with you in a year again and yeah. say, Lord, what are we going to talk about yeah. next? 
So as you start to look over that edge, what do you, what do you want to see? Well, I wouldn't even call that day with snow a low light. Uh, in many ways, it was an incredible moment. Like I said, I, I was out there with those young folks and we'd see just neighbors come by with a shovel and just help dig a bus out. Mm -hmm. We'd see somebody pull up with a pickup truck and, you know, say, you know, hook this onto the bus. And I mean, just people who were like, kind of private plow providers were helping to plow out the schools. I mean, it was an all hands on deck moment. And that for me has been the most uh, hope inspiring, awe inspiring thing of these last three months, uh, the incredible amount of energy that exists across our city of people who are ready to help, who want to be a part of this, uh, who don't even want their mayor to kind of disappear into City Hall and do good work. They want to do the work with us. Uh, and that's so exciting for me, which is why our focus is so heavily on service and inviting people into this. We're going to invite people to the state of the city to help us build that vision that we haven't uh, built out how we structure the budget conversation or how we even structure the budget address, but that'll be an engaging kind of you know two-way conversation as well. Uh, and so you know we're inviting folks I'd certainly invite folks to come uh, you know RSVP for the state of state of our city summit uh, that's going to be very important and I hope we can share the link right on we're here share it on here for yes. sure but even beyond that you know follow me on Facebook follow me on Twitter uh, because we're going to have just you know opportunity after opportunity to, for people to engage uh, we're going to very soon launch uh, serve St. Paul which is going to be an invitation for people uh, to come and volunteer at their recreation center their library or their school come get involved with their district council come serve on a board you know on a board or a task force uh, where the city is concerned uh, and so we're going to be launching an online tool on that uh, very soon that's a, and really so, exciting yeah we're excited mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're excited to do that and looking forward to kind of uh, connecting people with that and really leaning into this ethic of service in this moment that's great and so I still want to say so we all just have a couple minutes left mm -hmm. so with that little bit left I want to just touch on just very briefly those those three values equity yes. in, innovation and resilience and I see you being kind of embodying those values uh, I, I get the sense that you see that embodiment in the the team you've pulled together you want those qualities and values to be uh, revealed through service what mm -hmm. would you like to just comment on about those values you know as as I was running for mayor on occasion people would say equity would come up and people would say you know, what's, what's, what's your equity initiative for St. Paul? Uh, and it struck me that, you know, we're a over half billion dollar organization uh, with a whole bunch of full-time employees uh, and a whole bunch of different initiatives. And, and, and I would share with folks that if I can share with you my kind of discreet, kind of stand aside, stand alone equity initiative, that would be proof that I'm not serious about equity. And so equity, innovation, and resilience are the three things that we're lifting to the point of just core values. To say, these aren't initiatives, uh, they're lenses through which we have to view all of our work, uh, all of our policies, all of our employees, and every single dollar that the city spends. It has to be building a city that works for all of us and ensures that we're you know, touching every person in every part of our city, that's critical. We have to constantly think and rethink what it is we do, who it is that's relying on us, and how we meet those needs better and better every single day. And we have to know that we're building for the future, that change, our city is changing rapidly. We're, our population has grown by over 20,000 people in the last eight years alone. Our demographics are shifting. Uh, this, is a, a, this is a profoundly different city than it was when my great grandparents came here 100 years ago. It's a profoundly different city than I grew up in uh, just when I was a child. Uh, those changes can either be the biggest threat or the biggest opportunity for our community. And with you at the helm, I have no doubt that we'll continue to see it as an opportunity. That's we all we have time for today. Please come join us again on the SPNN Forum.